part of our project was comparative. We wanted to get some a sense of different kinds of comparison with what we were doing. So there are, in fact, two kind of comparisons at the heart of this. Laura and, and myself, who were both looking at the 1940s, um, but different nations with very, very different cultures, very, very different um, his, historical contexts. And uh, Vicky and Laura's comparison, um, both in Britain but different eras, uh, different concerns, different, different chronological contexts. Um, my research uh, prior to this was focused on children in wartime France. Um, and through this project, I've done more work on the policies towards them um, but I'm not looking at institutional policies, if you like. I'm not looking at the education system, and I'm not looking at structured youth groups, for example, because those things are being done by colleagues elsewhere. Um, I have been uh, foraging around in the archives of the Education Ministry, um, the Propaganda Ministry, and the Health and Family uh, Ministry, um, and uh, rooting through... Um, correspondence with Marshal Pétain, who was the head of the French state. But I'll, so that's the kind of source um, material that I've been looking at. Um, so in uh, June 1940, France fell to Germany after only six weeks of fighting. And the punitive armistice uh, imposed by the Germans divided the nation. You can see the little map there. Um, the northern part was occupied, the southern part was governed from the town of Vichy by Marshal Philippe Pétain, here he is, um, a very hugely popular, at first, 84-year-old hero of World War I. He and his colleagues began what they called a national revolution um, to change French values. They wanted to move away from republicanism, away from individualism, away from party politics, away from the so-called decadence of the previous decades in France. So the new regime, the Vichy government, was ultra-conservative, it was ruralist, it was paternalist, it was nationalist, it was anti-Semitic, and it was familialist. Um, it continued uh, the, the kind of um, obsession with family and with demography um, of the previous decades. Um, Pétain saw the family as the essential cell of French society. Um, a lot of historical work that's been done on this period, uh, looking at family, um, is, really revolves around women and women's place within that. So there's very little that looks at that other essential component. If you're going to have a family, it's got to have children in it, right? So, uh, but very few people have been looking at children's place within that. Um, children weren't just the subject of Vichy's vast propaganda. Um, they were also its objects. So this is what has really interested me. The, targeted campaigns that were aimed directly at children that entered into homes and entered into classrooms. I think that an analysis of the way that children were instrumentalized, the way that they were used by the Vichy regime, is a very useful gateway into thinking about children's agency, their engagement in society, and also their citizenship. Um, since the Enlightenment, Childhood has been understood as a period of formation and of separation from the adult world. Modern Western culture, as Laura has kind of outlined for the British case, has um, increasingly excluded children from the polity, allowing them only to enter it later on as adults. They are citizens in waiting. And this is partly a result, I think, of children's dual temporal identity, which is kind of at the heart of this project. Here and now, they're often defined by what they lack in skills, in competences, in rationality, in comparison to adults. They're sort of incomplete people, and therefore they're vulnerable and passive and dependent. So their social role, as small but very numerous actors in the life of a nation, gets rather elided. Their second temporal identity belongs to the future. And in the Western world, across the 19th into the 20th century, children have moved to the center of political concern, as Laura has spoken about. Um, concern for their health and well-being was driven by this, this 
increasing anxiety over future national strength, future national identity and future citizenship. This catapulting of children forwards into their own future um, comes from this deep-rooted vision, I think, that Laura also alluded to of that of children as becomings, as, as becoming something. They're not beings now, they're projects rather than people. And my research proposes that children's future symbolic identity is certainly part of the way Vichy instrumentalised children, but the regime also recognised children as social actors in the here and now. So it moved beyond this idea of children as citizens in waiting. Um, recent historical research has, uh, and I'm thinking of, say, Sonia Rose, Lucy Noakes, has revealed how the 20th century's world wars altered notions of citizenship, particularly women's citizenship. But in light of current attention in academia, but also beyond um, to children's citizenship, I think it's worth making the case that children's citizenly behaviour is neither negligible nor a new phenomenon. But we do need to think more carefully, perhaps, about how we define citizenship. Um, Laura referred earlier to the um, representation, representation of the People Act, so those political rights that give access to citizenship. But I think um, there are contemporary, more contemporary analyses of citizenship which see it as comprising something much more than just access to political rights and more than just the duties which are dependent upon them. And Gerard Delante, um, I think it's a political scientist, has included more qualitative and less universalist criteria, such as identity and a sense of identity and belonging, and also participation within the nation. I think citizenship should also be seen as experienced differently. It doesn't have to be experienced the same. Um, experienced differently by different parts of the nation, by men, women, and children. Um, so it's not this universalist idea, which certainly is held up uh, since the French Revolution, of what a citizen is. Um, of course, Vichy is anti-democratic. No one's voting in Vichy. And in this state where that kind of very... Um, sharp symbol of your citizenship, your voting rights, well, they've all gone out the window. So now citizenship becomes something rather more negotiable. And certainly for women, who don't get the, vote, the right to vote in France until 1944 anyway, um, certain types of citizenship start extending outwards towards women. They start being able to make much more of a case for their own participation in society. But I would like to argue that perhaps we can see it for children too. Um, I think as well that finding evidence of agency within the past is a way of recognising um, individuals as social actors in the past. And certainly in women's history, this was very important to seek out women's agency in various different forms within the past. And perhaps um, as a historian of, of children, um, we might want to look for children's agency in the past as well. In this presentation, I want to argue that first, that children were recognised by Vichy as having the ability to act, to change, to influence. They were recognised as having social agency. Um, in the first part, I'm going to look at how the regime used children, so a few examples of that. Um, but some of the most interesting material I've found in the archives are children's responses to that, so I want to try and bring children's voices um, into this. So, um, I think the regime is making use of children in three quite clear ways. First of all, there is a symbolic use, okay, which casts them passively, it doesn't really need them involved, as representatives of the future, of future national greatness, and particularly of future population growth. And this is particularly visible in the copious propaganda, and I give you a little bit here, um, which is promoting large families, which has typically only, as I said, been analysed in terms of motherhood and uh, Vichy's attitude towards women. And often the children in these pictures are chubby toddlers, they're babies, they're that very cutesy kind of child. Um, they're not your stringy 12-year-old or someone who's looking rather skinny and undernourished. Um, so we get these chubby, happy babies. And they appear as a mass, a crowd of little futures. Uh, and I'm quoting the propaganda agency and one of its campaigns saying, the child, with a big capital letter, symbol of restoration of the rebirth of French hope. 
So children's powerful symbolism overrode their present reality as people. The women's magazine, Votre Beauté, Your Beauty, informed its readers that the family was the laboratory where men of the future are made. So it's leapfrogging children's present and projecting those children directly into the future. And I think in this usage, this symbolic usage, children's mere existence is enough. Having children is privileged over being children. The second usage by the regime is, is something I've seen them as kind of Trojan horses, as intermediaries. They're schooled in various ways in the values of the regime, and it's expected that they will take those home with them from the schoolroom um, and pass them on to their parents to, to, to kind of achieve a much fuller penetration of French society. In a primary school manual, so manual for primary school teachers, this um, transmission is made quite explicit. And I'm quoting, respect and mutual confidence, a sharp sense of honor, the spirit of sacrifice. These are the virtues which should be developed in class so that the child takes them home with him. And important, adults were rather tainted by the past. The Vichy regime disapproved of how adults had been behaving in this decadent pre-war period. Um, so now children are given a role in re-educating their parents. A second example of these kind of Trojan horses can be found in a national drive which instructed every child, every school child under 14, to earn two francs to send through to Vichy to contribute towards the national charity. Um, but this drive was also seen as a way of reaching adults, and I'm quoting uh, the propaganda ministry, it's possible that this charitable feeling will have an influence inside families and even across the country. It will be a good example of solidarity in action which would be easy to use for more general propaganda. So an explicit um, desire to make use of that elsewhere, that children's, children's work um, in, in earning this money and behaving charitably. And in this time of great division in France, where you've got supporters of the Vichy regime, but increasingly uh, violent opponents of it, children carried values of national solidarity on their shoulders when they were evacuated. Um, they became agents of national unity who would link the town and the country together to, and I'm quoting, reinforce national sentiment and the unity of the fatherland. So once again, children are given this task of transmission which relies on their ability to influence their environment and build these bridges to assure future national cohesion. The third way that the regime used children um, was as people in the here and now, so recognizing children and their activity as children now. It actively sought their participation in various campaigns. And particularly evident examples of this are three Christmas surprises, 1940, 41, and 42, um, orchestrated for Marshal Petain. So children were, were invited to um, give a Christmas present, give a Christmas surprise to Marshal Petain. And the first Christmas surprise, children were invited to do a drawing of the corner of France they loved the most. So kind of reinforcing a sense of national, uh, national belonging and this would bring a smile to his lips, they were told, when he received them. So they were, they were told they had this personal power to make Pétain happy in his great, heavy task rebuilding the nation. Teachers were instructed to give minimum guidance, to send all drawings without selection, and two million, more than two million drawings arrived uh, for Pétain. I, I doubt he looked at all of them, but he certainly looked at some of them, and, and all children were... Um, the, the drawings were answered, you know, the, a response was given from his office. A Christmas surprise was repeated again in 1941, so when children returned to school in September of 1941, Petain gave a speech directed absolutely at school children, and he told them he was relying on them, on them to build the national revolution, so he boosted their sense of importance, but also constructed again this intimate relationship which excluded their parents. He said, you must understand that I count on you absolutely to help me reconstruct France and to make the French a great people, loyal and honest. And this wasn't just about the future, he said, I don't want to have to wait until you're grown-ups. 
he told them. Their contribution really mattered now. And in this speech, he proposed setting up what he called loyalty leagues. So these were classroom committees that children were supposed to set up by themselves in their classrooms to stamp out cheating and dishonesty in the classroom. So these loyalty leagues were to model loyalty, community, honesty, but they also encouraged the denunciation, the judgment, and the ostracization of those children who were not meeting social expectations. So the second Christmas surprise was to write a letter to Pétain explaining to him how well your loyalty leagues were going in your school. So he got a lot of um, letters about that, but I haven't ever found a, a number to say how many letters were sent. And the third Christmas surprise for the under-14s um, was the one that I've already mentioned. So that was the raising of two francs uh, through a charitable act you weren't allowed to just go to your piggy bank and take two francs out. You had to do something, and you were to send that through um, to Pétain. So children really mattered to the regime. Now, as children, they were beings as well as becomings. They were beings now. And it was recognised that even the very young had social influence, and national leaders sought to try and harness this. So in the, the, the second part, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how children responded. And I found lots and lots of evidence of children really engaging with the regime and its values. And in particular, Pétain emerges very strongly as this great hero, but also as a role model. Um, and it's worth saying that heroes um, play a really important role in children's identity formation. And given that these children's hero fell so dramatically in 1944 when he was arrested, he was incarcerated, he was, um, he was judged and, and, and died um, in prison, but this hero fell so, so forcefully in 1944, so we might wonder, and this would be something else, about that impact on young people's identities thereafter. However, um, Children's essays, some school essays which I've discovered, show the ways in which they were encouraged to think about him. So a 13-year-old girl, Pierrette, wrote, The Marshal is not only a brave man, he's also a good man. I love him because he's the leader of France. I love him because he loves work. Finally, I love him because he's a good leader, as I'm sure he will lift up once more this beaten and exhausted, exhausted France. That's why, French girls, if we want to live in a beautiful France, joyful and gay like before, we must work hard. So her rallying words there look to the future of the nation, created through her leaders' qualities of courage, honesty, and hard work. And those words echo perhaps as well her schoolmistress's um, exhortation to work hard in class, um, but it's also a broader denunciation of her, the values of her parents' generation, that generation of decadence of the 1930s. In other cases, um, so that's a school essay, in other cases the letter writing appears more spontaneous, but we can never know with sources like this whether there was a parent standing next to the child as they wrote it. We don't know what prompted those children to write. But a lot of these letters are very earnest, and um, all of them that I found were answered by Petain's office. And there's hundreds, thousands of them. Um, often they were sent small gifts of jam or sweets um, or writing paper in response for the letters they sent. So it's really cultivating this relationship. Claire wrote to tell Pétain of her confidence in, them, in him. She said she was worried about France's predicament, but knowing France is in your hands, I feel comforted and happy because I know she'll become great again. A portrait of Pétain was a really prized possession, and Serge told his leader, I've stuck on my walls uh, all the pictures of you that I can find, from the smallest to the biggest. I've decorated the best one with flags and put it in front of my bed, so you're the first thing I see when I wake up. So that real adoration, that kind of hero worship. Um, there are other types of letter where parental influence seems a bit less likely. So a six-year-old boy, Gérard, he sent Pétain a drawing of a squirrel, which you can see there, um, and told him, I've picked lots of green beans to preserve for the winter. If you need some, I'll send them to you. So the instrumentalization, I think, of children's emotional connection is quite clear here. Um, and finally, um, I think children were 
very aware of the contribution that they were expected to make to the nation. And they seemed very enthusiastic about being part of reconstructing France. And there's a sense of empowerment by this contribution that they're expected to make by carrying out their patriotic, patriotic duties now and in the future. So um, about the loyalty league that was set up in his school, Claude said that before this league was established, it was all unfair. But now everything is back in order. No pupil is copying or cheating in his work. The pupil who is top of the class really deserves that place. Please believe, Monsieur le Maréchal, that what you asked has been carried out by all pupils. So Claude sees this kind of meritocratic solution to cheating in class, and he wanted to assure Pétain of his readiness to obey. Um, there are um, also letters that I found from girls at a housewife school, um, and they were writing to report their progress. So Georgette said um, that they were learning how to be true French women who will contribute to the recovery of the nation. Their task as future housewives and mothers was very strongly connected to the nation's salvation and bound into this obedience to the leader. So Lucette said, Maréchal, here we are, yes, here we are. Thanks to you, we'll become good housewives who will raise their children as you wish. That is, in the right way to pull France up higher than all the other people of Europe. So this prospective motherhood is in the future, but their engagement with the gendered values of the regime, as well as this internalization of their contribution to the nation, is here in the present. Um, the mobilization of children around Mother's Day also gives us some evidence of how children are thinking through those norms of the regime. So 12-year-old um, Roger wrote in a letter, all of this mum, every child owes to his mother because it's she who does her duty the most in creating the families that populate the country with inhabitants who will fight for their fatherland and all do their, they all do their duty. So there's an intensive exposure to the idea of maternal national duty and of demographic growth. And boys and girls understood motherhood and family as a contribution to the greater good. Um, so I'm going to conclude now. Um, my research for this project has shown that children were really valued by the Vichy regime as small-scale actors with social influence. They were given citizenly duties and responsibilities. They absorbed and worked with the values of the regime, and they participated in a range of its activities. At other times, it also suited the regime to characterize them as passive and dependent objects of adult concern or as future human capital. So there are those different uses taking place. Um, total war in the 1940s shifted notions of citizenship. Children's citizenship is a topic of current interest, but historians have rarely taken citizenship, historians of childhood have rarely taken citizenship as an analytical focus. Children have long, seen, have long been seen as outside of citizenship because of this deficit model um, of childhood which Western society has constructed. They're incomplete and incompetent in relation to adults, so not capable of enacting citizenship in the same way as adults. So this is a, a future-orientated model. Children are typically constructed in instrumentalist terms as future adults rather than social actors, rather than as children in the present. But if we define children as not as lacking, but as complete as children, and if we define citizenship itself as performed and experienced differently by different parts of the population, we can start to see children emerging as active citizens in the past. Thank you very much. <laughs>